Um, our first speaker is coming from Walter Delat's lab. Amin al uh, did his training at the University of Delft in the Netherlands in um, bioinformatics, and now he's a postdoc in Walter's lab. And he is going to um, give us a talk today on a new experimental and computational method to understand multi-ligation products um, using C technologies. So uh, Amin, if you're ready, go ahead and um, load up your um, slides and take it away. Okay. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and I will be talking about multi-way interactions that happen in the genome. This is indeed Amin Allahyar. I'm from Delft, and I will be talking about multi-way interactions. Um, so the manuscript is also accepted in Nature Genetics, but the, the full version is already accessible in BioArchive. Okay, let's dive into the problem. Uh, I assume that many people in this audience are already able to understand interactions and genome interactions, so I decided to come up with an example. In this example, there are two recent papers that showed two uh, silent oncogenes. Let me use the laser. I hope you can see this. Uh, two silent oncogenes that were isolated by these CTCF sites from an active enhancer. The interesting part was that perturbation of these CTCF sites, which are responsible for holding this loop together, was enough either by methylation or deletion of these CTCF sites to activate these oncogenes, and that would promote the cancer development, of course. But there are, there are, there are of course, myriad of methods available to investigate these interactions. In one side, we have genome-wide methods like HI-C that are able to unravel interactions with uh, from any part of the genome with any other part of the genome, and using those, you can think about genome compartment analysis or typically or top uh, topologically associated domains. But then you also need a massive amount of reads to be sequenced. Think about 500 million reads. On the other hand, for some topics that are only interested in a specific region of the genome, uh, it is suggested to use a targeted approach like 4C or circularized chromosome confirmation capture, which requires far fewer number of reads to be sequenced. Using those approach, you can just ask if a gene is interacting with few enhancers, or here, like, for example, I'm showing you enhancer A or enhancer B. You can investigate these interactions with very few number of reads, and that's the, that's the target of my talk here. Let's dive into 4C and then see how this protocol works. Uh, here, through formaldehyde fixation, restriction enzyme digestion, and also religation, we end up with the so-called 3C template. That's the invention of Joop Decker in 2002. And it basically, this structure holds fragments that were in close proximity of each other with insect cell nucleus at the time of fixation. 4C further takes these 3C templates and then make by the cross-linking and second round of digestion, digestion make some circularized DNA fragments. And these circularized DNA fragments can be enriched for the circles that contain our viewpoint, and that's basically the, the gene that I showed you in the previous slide. And then using inverse PCR, we can create reads that are ready to be sequenced in Illumina sequencing. There are two things here that is an issue. One, these circles would create multiple reads, so they are not unique due to amplification of PCR. On the other hand, these are just pairwise interactions. So you cannot really say if, for example, gene is interacting with two enhancer or is, is the interactions just pairwise. Let me elaborate this with a schematic. So imagine that I sequenced all reads uh, that I could capture and then show them in a, in a frequency plot. So in, in x-axis, you see the region of interest, and this yellow bar represent, represented by an anchor is our viewpoint, and then here I'm showing you the coverage on y-axis. You can see that, for example, we have bar blue and then bar purple to be frequently interacting with our viewpoint. But then we, have, we can make two conclusions out of this. In one hand, we have cooperative interactions, in a sense that all three elements are interacting together. But then on the other hand, we can also have pairwise interactions in the population. So we can have, for example, yellow fragments to interact with the purple fragment while the blue fragment is out. On the other hand, we can have blue fragment to interact with yellow fragment 
and then the purple fragment is out. So as you can see, just looking at pairwise interactions are not enough to take into account the interactions that can co co occur multi uh, simultaneously within a nucleus. Okay. Um, but then also we need to consider the fact that PCR duplicates are going to change the frequency of observed fragments. So in this case, I am showing you that, for example, interactions between yellow and blue are amplified multiple times while the interactions between purple and yellow is not amplified that much. So that changes the ratio of observed interactions, and that is problematic. In order to resolve these problems, we devise multi-contact for C. Basically, multi-contact for C try to integrate, try to use 3C templates, but instead of using digestion, second digestion to make shorter concatenators, it try to use six space pair cutters that cut less often, of course. This results in longer reads or longer concatenators that once sequenced can provide multi-way interactions. And of course, for sequencing, we need to use nanopore sequencing instead of Illumina sequencing because these reads are often larger than what Illumina can sequence. Okay, now diving a bit into the computational side of uh, MC4C, uh, first, we need to process the raw reads into uh, fragments that they contain and then map them into reference genomes. So here you can see, for example, that I'm mapping these fragments and then we ended up with a, a viewpoint fragment, a purple fragment, and a blue fragment. So these can represent two enhancer and then one gene, for example. And then we need to remove the PCR duplicates that I just mentioned, the problem. And then finally, we can start analyzing these associations. In order to remove the PCR duplicates, we exploited the fact that far cis or trans fragments are very unlikely to be captured multiple times in different nucleus. In the other word, if a single fragment that are mapped in the far cis region appear multiple times in our data set, we can conclude that the corresponding reads are basically duplicates of each other. So we basically keep one and then remove others. Okay, now we have MC4C. Let's apply this to a couple of locus and then see how the result would look like. In the first locus, we apply this in most beta-globin locus. It is interesting because this locus has multiple super enhancer that is represented here. So these hypersensitive sites and then multiple gene as well. It is hypothesized that once these genes are active, these enhancers come together and then express the genes or beta-globin genes. Now, using MC4C, we can for the first time investigate where, whether this theory is actually correct. Okay. For the first experiments, I'm going to show you an, uh, results when the viewpoint is placed on top of beta-globin. After nanopore sequencing, we ended up with about a million number of reads. And then, as expected, their mean size distribution is around 2 kb. Further, there are about 250,000 reads that contain three or more number of fragments. But these reads are actually raw reads that contain duplicated reads as well. So after removing these reads, we end up with about 10,000 unique molecules that uniquely represent the interacting, the interacting fragments within each nucleus. Okay, now we can look at the overall profile of these uh, cells. In overall profile, we can, for the first time, select viewpoints and also reads that contain any other site of interest, which we call soy. So here I'm selecting circles that have beta globin as the viewpoint, which is here, and then HS2 as site of interest. Now we can ask what else are in these circles. And that's the profile that I'm showing in green. What is interesting is that not only HS2, which is expected because we are selecting them, other hypersensitive sites are also showing a peak. This represents that when HS2 is interacting with beta globin, other hypersensitive sites are also co-captured. The missing piece here 
is that we cannot tell if this observation is more than expected by chance. Basically, we require an association test that can tell us if the significance of association between beta major, HS2, and for example, HS4 is more than expected by chance. In order to answer this question, we devised the following association test. For a second, imagine we separate our reads into two sets, positive set and negative set. In the positive set, our reads contain HS2, and of course, beta major because it is the viewpoint. On the negative set, our reads do not have HS2. So now, in the positive set, we can ask how many reads contain HS4 as well. So remember that reads in the positive set contain beta major as our viewpoint, contain HS2 as our soy because we selected according to them, and now we want to know how many HS4 exist in those reads. On the other hand, in negative set, we can ask what is the expected observation frequency of HS4. To do that, we need to subsample this set of reads equal to number of positive sets. So now, for example, if positive set is 800 reads, we also need to subsample randomly from negative set equal to 800 reads, and then each time ask how many HS4 do we observe in these fragments. That will give us a distribution, say a background distribution. So now we have an observed distribution and also a background distribution, which comparing these two, we can state the significance of observing HS4 when beta major and HS2 are together. Okay, applying this test on uh, beta major and then of course HS2, we could see that HS2 and HS4, HS, sorry, HS3 and HS4 are significantly enriched when HS2 is contacting beta globin, meaning that these hypersensitive sites are co-captured and also significantly enriched when HS2 is contacting beta major. We can, of course, select soy from different hypersensitive sites. And that's what we did. And I'm showing the result in this plot. So here, in the, in the previous plot, I showed you when we select HS2, what would be the significance of HS4 and HS3? We can do the same thing when we select the soy as hypersensitive one or HS1. We can also see that the enrichment, and then here I'm showing you the blue because you know, the association is positive, we can also see when we select HS1, the same phenomena appear. We apply the same method on fetal brain, which we expect that these genes are not active. Once we did the same experiment, we observed that the hypersensitive site in, in the vicinity, which, is, which are in the linear vicinity of each other, cannot get away from not being captured when HS3, for example, is uh, having contact with beta major. But then when you go further, HS2, which is far away from HS4, or HS1, which is far away from HS3 and HS4, do not show enrichment, meaning that in order to highly activate the genes, these enhancers need to come together and core cluster to help with the activation of beta globin gene. Okay. Um, in the next experiment, we started to think about loop extrusion model. Loop extrusion model is a model that it states that cohesin, cohesin is responsible for stabilizing the loops once it reaches co-convergent CTCF sites. Later, WAPO is responsible for removing cohesin and therefore restarting the procedure. Recently, Harhouse and her colleagues investigated this phenomenon even further. What they did is to knock out WAPO and then applied high C. On this side of this matrix, you can see the wild type cells. You can see that not much is happening here. But then once they removed WAPO by knocking out WAPO, then they started to see peaks or dots, which is very famous in uh, high C. This states that interactions of these appear compared to white type. They propose that loops in absence of a are extended. So once this loop is opened and 
once this loop is created and WAPO is not there to open it, these loops would extend further and further and they call this loop extension. This is an interesting topic or interesting locus for MC4C because we can investigate simultaneously where is the location of these CTCF sites when two CTCFs are interacting with each other. Once we applied MC4C on this locus, an interesting phenomenon has happened. We place our viewpoint on one of these CTCF sites and then the site, the site of interest is selected completely on the other side of the locus. What we observe is that other CTCF sites also appear. So you can see that these two CTCF sites are highly enriched. Of course, we change our viewpoint to a different CTCF and then place our soil site of interest on the completely on the other side. We also observe these peaks to appear. This states that once WAPO is absent, the reeling in of DNA continues on the other side. Once this continues, then these loops start to bump into each other. On the other side, this can also happen, right? So this, the same thing happened over and over, and then these loops start to bump each other and then get trapped. We call this cohesion traffic jam and, it's, and indicates that once WAPO is not present in these cells, these loops keep getting, to, getting trapped to each other to form a, a complete mix of loops that cannot be opened anymore. In conclusion, I showed you that MC4C can provide multiple view of interactions in the genome. Also, this is possible to do that in a single allele resolution. I showed you the results for beta globin locus and showed you how enhancers co-localize when active beta globin G is, is expressing. Finally, in WAPO knockout cells, we showed a cohesion traffic jam that is happening when WAPO is not present to open the loops anymore. In the end, I would like to thank my colleagues, Walter Delat, Cardo Vermoulen, Brita Bowman, and Riron de Rieder for helping with this MC4C project. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much.